Thank you, Skip, and Reverend Copley, thank you for the invitation. Skip didn't mention the 10-year effort it took to get fluoride in our water so our teeth would be hard. I mean, it's not quite every six years an easy thing that we take on. I really am very pleased to see the, the faces here, the diversity of interest here, the interest in what for three decades we really didn't pay much attention to, our health care delivery system, how we finance it, what we expect of it, uh, and what the challenges are faced in it. What I would like to do in the next 30 minutes is to take you on a little bit of a tour and, you know, truth in advertising. I'm a faculty member at UAMS. I get one paycheck. Um, the Center for Health Improvement has been a health policy development unit uh, housed within UAMS but supported from across the state by different corporate entities for the last 15 years. Uh, we have an independent policy board and for now two administrations. Uh, the first Republican Governor Huckabee, the second Democratic Governor Beebe have hired me, paid me 50% of my salary to be their advisor. So I'm going to give you the same advice that I give to the legislators or to the governor. Uh, and I want to be open for questions at the end for any question that you want to ask around that path because if you're going to ask it, I'm probably going to get asked it somewhere else and I might as well practice. Uh, so let me take you first on a little bit of a historical tour of how we got here then where we are, third, what we're doing about it, and then fourth, close on what the big decisions are that our General Assembly uh, uh, is going to have to make in the next three or four months. I was a chemistry major at Hendricks. I went as far away from my father's history profession as I could get, but I'll be darned if I didn't get brought right back to it. Because in our U.S. Constitution, when they set it up in the 1780s, they said whatever is not explicitly the responsibility delegated to the federal government falls to the states. Well, let me start on a little bit of a history lesson that I've had to relearn. First, we didn't discover penicillin until 1928. So it wasn't in the constitutional discussions in the 1780s, our healthcare system. Second, we didn't use it in a patient until a little over almost 70 years ago. So I want you to stop and think about everything in our healthcare delivery system has really come about in the last 70 years. It's constantly in change, it's never been fixed, and it's always had problems. And it every periodically goes through dramatic changes. So just fix in your mind that our whole healthcare system, what consumes 18% of our gross domestic product nationwide, probably 20%, one of every $5 within our state, has been developed in the last 75 years. Something else happened in the 40s, and many of you have heard me say this before, we in the United States took a different path for how we were going to finance health care than every other developed nation. We were at war. We had millions of our young men overseas. We had other young men, and importantly many women, in the manufacturing base here at home. There was great economic pressure to inflate rate wages, and the federal government put a wage freeze in place. They said, you can't give a wage increase. But employers are smart. They said, I can't give you a wage increase, but I can give you something else. It's called health insurance. I'll pay for when you need to go to the doctor. So we added, actually we used penicillin. We didn't have much that we were treating back in 1944. <laughs> We added wage controls and the employer's response to offer health insurance coverage. And that's how our country took a very different path than every other developed country of using employers as the basis for health insurance. Our GIs came back. We had the growth of the manufacturing industry in the 1950s. And people with unions negotiating their benefits got good health care benefits. But we had some problems. Our older folks that weren't working anymore and our poor folks and disabled folks didn't have employer-sponsored health insurance. But again, it wasn't the federal government's responsibility, it was the state's responsibility. The federal government said, we've got to help. So they offered low or no interest loans through the Hill-Burton Act for communities to build hospitals. If you go across our state, if you go across most states, hospitals in the community were built between 1957 and 1959 on Hill-Burton funds you go down Interstate 630, St. Vincent's, Baptist, UAMS, all built with Hilburton funds. They've expanded since then, but the agreement then to get the funds were that they would treat patients without regard to their ability to pay. 
And in every one of those emergency rooms, there is a little plaque that says, we'll treat you without regard to your ability to pay. Now, treatment means something different now than it did then. Today, it's treat, stabilize, and release, where back then it was really to treat for the full need of the patient. We had the Korean War. Y'all, many of you from looking at the faces have seen MASH, where we learned to do a lot more invasive procedures, surgeries, and anesthesias. We started developing cancer treatments. We birthed the National Institutes of Health. But we still had this problem that our poor and disabled and our elderly didn't have a mechanism to pay. So in 1965, actually of interest, uh, led by uh, the uh, Arkansas uh, Congressman Wilbur Mills, uh, President Lyndon Johnson signed into law the Medicare and Medicaid Act. We'll go into a little more detail later, but just as a crib note, you care for the elderly, you aid the poor. Uh, so file that one away. Uh, we continue to have efforts to refine our system. The HMO Act was actually in response to uh, President Nixon's broad uh, proposal for health care reform. He ran into little problems and didn't get to actually see that through. Uh, in the 90s, employers and Medicaid started using HMO. We had the state children's health insurance program. Our Our Kids First was, is now just uh, uh, 15 years old. 15 years ago, 20 percent of kids in the state had no health insurance coverage. Today, that's down to around 6 or 7 percent, with many of those having other eligibility. We didn't add prescription drugs to the seniors program until a little under 10 years ago. And finally, last year, we had, or two years ago, we had the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. What I want to show is our healthcare system's constantly evolving. It's never been fixed. We try different things, and we are moving in a path to try to get to a better place. Now, let me go just for a second on why the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act happened from my perspective. Uh, our healthcare system was at a tipping point and largely falling apart, both on the public and the private sector side. I'm going to get to Medicaid, but I want to set the stage for the whole healthcare system. These are the premiums for Arkansas privately insured individuals over the last 10 years. The cost for health insurance went from $6,300 in 2000 for a family of four up to $11,800 a year for a family of four in 2010. The blue portion of the bar, because most of us get insurance from our employer, is the employer's contribution. The red portion are the family's contributions. Both employers and families could not sustain that growth rate. So we had many families and some employers just opt out. I can't continue to afford this. My revenues from an employer's perspective, my wages from an employee's perspective aren't growing enough to allow me to continue to participate in health insurance. Well, when you drop out, it doesn't mean that you're not going to need health care. Okay? If you're healthy, you're playing Russian roulette because you may need it tomorrow. If you're unhealthy, then you're not taking care of something that needs to be taken care of today and you're going to have more and worse outcomes in the future. So this led, and importantly, we had the economic recession in the middle, so it actually became worse. We had more and more people not participating in our health insurance system. To the point that this was uh, 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 in 2012, we now in our state have 25% of 19 to 64 year olds who do not have any form of health insurance coverage, one in four. Now it's not evenly distributed. If you work for a big employer or you have a higher wage, therefore those that are in central Arkansas, you're more likely to be covered. If you're in working in rural Arkansas for a very small employer at a lower wage, the insurance premiums aren't much different and you're not able to afford that. So we now have some counties with over 30 percent of their 19 to 64 year old population uninsured. Most of those individuals are working at least one full-time job or they're the spouse of a family member working a full-time job. So these are not non-contributing members of our society. They're just people that are taking the risk of not having insurance and hoping that they don't need health care. Now, that risk is not unmitigated. The, lar the single largest cause of personal bankruptcy in our state is unpaid health care claims. So when they need care and they go to the hospital, and now they are treated, but they also have their credit card run, the credit card companies now starts pursuing unpaid bills, and you end up driving people into personal bankruptcy. So this is not just a health care issue. This becomes a community-wide issue. The County with the highest uninsured rate, by the way, is in southwestern Arkansas. Union County has 37% of its 
uh, 19 to 64 year olds uninsured. Let me make this another tie. If you're a graduating physician or pharmacy student or nursing student at UAMS, why are you going to go start to practice in a county when 40% of the people coming through the door can't pay their bill? You're going to stay in central Arkansas and further exacerbate our access issues across the state in the most depressed and restricted uh, areas. Now this is a patchwork quilt that we've put together that shows essentially where people in our state get health insurance coverage from. Uh, on the vertical axis is poverty level. 100% of the poverty, the federal government sets the poverty level. 100% is for a family of four at $17,500 a year. It varies by how many are in your family, but let's just take a family of four, 17,500. 200% is 35,000, 300% is 52,500. Age across the, the horizontal axis. Virtually everyone at age 65 is covered by Medicare, the federal program for the aged. Uh, if you work for a large, large employer or have a high enough wage, you're in the private insurance pool. We have done well and put limited resources into Medicaid, our kids first A, or the children's health insurance program B. We call it the same and we run it the same, so from now on I'll call it just our kids. We cover over 60% of children in the state through the our kids program. And because we're covering the children after they're born, we took our tobacco settlement money and covered the pregnancies for the mother before they deliver. Didn't make sense to take care of the baby and miss the chance to have a healthy pregnancy. But importantly in our state, and we are one of the leanest states in terms of benefits, we in Alabama, if you're not pregnant in our state to be on Medicaid, you have to make less than about 20% of the federal poverty level. For an individual, that's about $3,000 a year. And have less than $2,000 in assets. And have a condition that makes you be Social Security uh, uh, disabled for 12 months. So each of those is an and. Less than 20% poverty, less than 2,000 assets, and disabled for 12 months to be on our Medicaid program if you're between 19 and 64 years of age. So when people came off their private employer insurance, there's no safety net there to capture them when they fall on hard times. So we estimate, this is an older estimate, we estimate today after the economic recession somewhere between 550 and 600,000 of our 2.9 million residents are uninsured and going bare is the insurance language. So that's where we are today. Let me say what we're doing about it. I'll go through this fairly quickly. We have organized our state's efforts uh, to really take on five different areas uh, to try to achieve both improved health of our population, enhance the care that we provide, and to reduce or control the cost growth, that stair step up. Uh, we are moving to a different care delivery strategy, one that offers to every Arkansan a patient-centered medical home where there is a team in place to help you take care of your needs. And the second is for a concentrated episode-based approach when you have an acute need so that there is actually a quarterback on the team who's in charge of your care. Too much of the time right now we have a team that's providing care but there's no quarterback. We want a quarterback assigned and fiscally accountable for the outcomes that are going to come forward. We've got five different strategies under that, payment innovation, workforce development, consumer engagement, health information technology, and expanded coverage. I'm going to run through the first four and get to the expanded coverage, which is why you came here today. Workforce strategic planning, for the first time ever we have a strategic plan for our higher education and training our workforce. We want team-based patient-centered care. We think every new clinician ought to be using health information technology. We want to increase the supply and improve the availability of primary care providers, and we need to align the way we pay for care to get the outcomes we want, not just to pay for services that are provided. We've had a system that for too long has paid for things to happen to you, not paid for what the outcome is that you want and your family members want for you. The payment improvement is trying to directly achieve that. We want to reward quality care and outcomes. We want to ensure that you're getting the most effective clinical care possible. We want to promote early intervention and coordination. It is much more costly if we wait till you're sicker than if we intervene earlier. And finally, we want to ensure that the team performance achieves the highest level of quality and value, value being what we pay for and what we get out of the system. 
Health information technology, here's an area we're really making an advance. Uh, we were one of the laggard states in using health information technology. And we actually now have over half of our Arkansas primary care providers committed to electronic health records, adoption and use. They've been paid over $86 million through the federal Medicare and state Medicaid program in incentives. We have an alliance for health records exchange. Think of this as a secure internet. Uh, where the doctors can share your clinical information without fear of it being hacked into or made available and point-to-point -point distribution. And finally, we got the second largest Commerce Department uh, grant to expand broadband access out into the rural parts of the state so that the rural physician has the same opportunity to provide you highly coordinated, efficient, and effective care as the physician sitting at UAMS Children's St. Vincent's or Baptist. So this is, I think, an important advance. And now we have the decisions before us on the Affordable Care Act insurance expansion. I showed you the patchwork quilt before, and essentially we ha have two decisions before the state. Let me start with the one which we have a decision of whether we're in control or whether the federal government's in control, and that is our private health insurance exchange. We think there are about 150 to 200,000 Arkansans who may be eligible for a tax credit to buy private insurance tax credits on a sliding scale. The, the, the lower income folks get more help than the higher income folks. It phases out at about 400, 350 percent of poverty. We think there are about 150 to 200,000 folks that could avail themselves of between one and one and a half billion dollars in new tax credits to help buy health insurance coverage. That is going to happen. It is in the Affordable Care Act. The Supreme Court upheld it. The only issue is whether the state runs the exchange or the federal government runs the exchange. And you've seen the debate in our legislative process, and it goes on. And I'm going to stop that discussion here, because that wasn't the reason that you all came. But it will continue to go on for a few more months. From my advisory perspective, Arkansans will be best served when they pick up the telephone if they're talking to an Arkansan. The federal government exchange is going to be built to work for California, Florida, and New York City. And there's a difference there. And the question is, do we want to control the face or do we want the federal government to control the face? The other big decision, and this is one the Supreme Court explicitly gave to the states, was are we going to expand our Medicaid program up to 135, you'll hear 138 percent, the difference is in a federal uh, accounting mechanism, but 135 percent of poverty, which we think there are about a quarter million people and it represents a billion to a billion and a half new dollars that could flow into the state. That is now a state decision. Let me go a little bit into the programmatic mechanics because I've got to go into the weeds a little bit. I'm going to try to keep us out of hitting the ground, but we've got to go into the weeds just a little bit. Differences between the two programs of Medicare and Medicaid. Now, remember, these were passed in 1965. They are components of the Social Security Act. So it's Title 18 of the Social Security Act is Medicare. Title 19 is Medicaid. Just stay on the left with me for a second. The Medicare program is fully federally funded. It serves those over age 65, those with permanent disabilities, and, and those with renal failure. You got four parts. Some of you are participating in those parts. Part A is hospital, part B is medical. We don't have as much part C, which is the Medicare Advantage plans in our state, and then part D is prescription drugs. There's no income test. When you hit 65, if you're a U.S. citizen and you've contributed you get to have access to the Medicare program. Now come over on the right side with me. Medicaid is a partnership between the federal government and states. It provides health care and long-term coverage to low-income children, pregnant women, disabled. It provides support for the frail elderly requiring institutional care. Three quarters of our nursing home beds in this state are paid for by Medicaid. So the elderly that become frail and non-supported three-quarters of those that are in nursing homes are paid for by Medicaid. And importantly, it is means-tested, meaning that there is an income limit and in our state an asset test that says you have to be below this level to be eligible to participate. Now, some descriptions in the program. The federal government and the state partnership is pretty unique and it means that there are 50 plus the territories different Medicaid programs. One Medicaid program doesn't look like the next Medicaid program for the most part. The federal government says you have to cover these benefits and the states get to determine what optional services they cover. The federal government says you have to cover these minimum services, minimum uh, beneficiaries, and the states get to determine how far 
above they expand. I'll say we're pretty much at the minimum. We have not chosen to expand for our adults. The federal financing rate is determined by how impoverished the state is. It ranges from 50-50, the richest states, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, others have a 50-50 match rate, meaning when the state puts up 50 cents, the federal government matches it with 50 cents. To the poorest state is 82.18. New Mexico puts up 18 cents and gets 82 cents to make the dollar whole. We are in that poor state range. In 2004, we were at a 77% match rate. I'll come to our deficit in the Medicaid in a moment. We are relatively better off now, so that match rate has changed a little bit, and it's causing us some challenge. The state determines the benefit level. You'll hear a couple of technical terms. I just want to give you waivers. There are two kinds of waivers. For, well, actually, there are three ways that a state can change its partnership. One is a state plan amendment, which is a little tweak that the federal government can easily agree to. The other are big changes through waivers. You'll hear an 1115 waiver that's statewide. A 1915B waiver is just one community at a time. We don't really do 1915Bs. Ours is pretty much statewide. And this state determining the benefit level is the reason the Supreme Court said the Affordable Care Act went too far. It cannot force states to determine the benefit level. It, it can give states the option to elevate the benefit level, and that's what now the decision is that's in front of us. Now, just a little bit of perspective. This is U.S. median household income for 2011. Here is Arkansas. We have the fifth lowest median household income. That's if you line all the households up in the state, the middle household, we have the fifth lowest median household income in the United States. What this means to me is our households have much less discretionary income with which they can spend on health care or health insurance or anything else. We're a relatively poor state. Maryland has a median household income of almost $60,000 a year. So this is a big difference. Now, median household income is the major determinant of what your matching rate is for Medicaid. So the match rate here, our match rate, and I mentioned in 2004 was 77% because we have done relatively better than other states through this economic recession. The formula has lowered our match rate to be 70 cents on the dollar from 77 cents on the dollar. Now, if the federal government's putting up seven cents less, that means the state has to put up seven cents more. So this is the, one of the big drivers on our Medicaid budget deficit that we are facing today. And you can see we are still relatively over here on the beneficial side of the federal match compared to the richer states that only get 50-50 uh, in the traditional Medicaid program. Now the next slide is what I think is the biggest travesty that we have been forced because of our poverty to deal with. This is the level of coverage through Medicaid for working parents nationwide. You can see our level of coverage is somewhere right here around 20%. Actually for, for parents it's 13%, for jobless parents it's 13%. If you work we give you a little bit of extra leeway, you can get a, at 17% of the federal poverty level. You can see some other states. Tennessee has expanded up to 135%. Rhode Island and Maine, Maine's actually up to 200% of the federal poverty level. So parents in Maine that make $44,000 a year are eligible for their Medicaid program. Parents in our state that make more than $6,000 a year are not eligible for our Medicaid program. So again, this is a big difference between states because states have chosen to use the Medicaid program for very different reasons. The Affordable Care Act is not going to help Maine at all because they're already over 135% of the poverty level. It's not going to help, what is that, that's Minnesota at all because they're over the 200% of poverty level. It is going to help states potentially that are below the 135% poverty level. Now, here is essentially the eligibility decision that our General Assembly has to make. Today, for single adults, if you're jobless and you make more than $1,400 a year, or if you're working $1,800, and if you have more than $2,000 in assets, and if you're not disabled, you can't get on our program. The Affordable Care Act gave the states the option to say, if you make up to $15,000 a year with no asset test and with no disability, you can now come on the federal partnership with the states on the Medicaid program. This results in, we have about 
200,000 covered today, there are about a, another 250,000, the peach or salmon colored on that patchwork quilt, that we think could be covered in the coming year. Now, what about our shortfall? How are you going to expand Medicaid while we have this budget shortfall? This is where it gets really difficult to articulate, but I'm going to try. All right, our D Department of Human Services projects about a $300 million state general revenue shortfall. And remember right now, we're getting 70 cents on the dollar. So when we put up 300 million, the federal government's matching that 70-30. So it ends up being about a billion dollar shortfall on a four and a half billion dollar program. So this is not a small shortfall. It's caused by three really important issues. Reduction in the federal matching percentage. We've gone, as I mentioned, from 77% in 2004 to 71%. Round numbers, if you have a $5 billion program and you gotta pay for 1% more, that's $50 million. So six times 50 is $300 million. That's real close to where our shortfall is. Uh, so this is a reduction in the matching percentage. We've also used stimulus funds and trust funds, the Tobacco Settlement Trust Fund and the Soda Pop Trust Fund to offset the general revenue needs over the past four years. And importantly, this is why we're doing the payment improvement effort, the program costs continue to grow faster than our state gross domestic product and our tax base. Program costs growing at about 6% through our payment improvement effort. We projected that if we can get that to 3 or 4%, we can continue to afford the program over time. Currently, the governor's recommendations close the shortfall to 138 million or match 425, but we still got a difference here that we're going to have to find a way to resolve. Now, how would expansion help the state? This is kind of two part. One, Reverend Copley mentioned earlier, uh, actually, in the second bullet, we've got unmet health care needs that this would help us address. The first bullet, and this goes back to the variation in states and what they've done. I think it's a one-time opportunity to strive for complete coverage and catch up to the richer states. It is not fair that a working mom in Arkansas could be disadvantaged in the same way that if she were in Maine, she would be advantaged. That is a leveling of the playing field that I think we have an obligation for our citizens. Now, the rest of this has been put forth by Dr. Andy Allison, our Medicaid director, and I've summarized it here. These numbers will. Uh, these numbers won't change, the numbers I'll show you on the next page may change. You know, it is fiscally advantageous for the state to expand Medicaid. For the expanded coverage, it's 100% federally funded for the first four years, and in 2020, when we would owe 10%, that's the maximum currently that we would owe, the governor has secured an opt-out provision to say that the state could opt out if we didn't want to do it. I think it would be difficult once we expanded, so I think we have to go in saying that we're going to owe 10 percent of this in 2021 to continue, and I would not uh, mislead our, our legislative uh, members on that. Importantly, it starts to take over for the existing patchwork in the Medicaid program. Right now, we cover pregnancy only, and we pay 30 percent of over 50 percent of the pregnancies in the state of Arkansas. If you had a full benefit package that covered pregnancy completely, paid for 100% federal funds, we don't owe the 30% anymore. Okay, so all of those little patches that we've used Medicaid for that we're paying 30% on, the federal government takes over. So that's a big component of the savings to our Medicaid program. In addition, our state runs a lot of uncompensated care in our prison systems, in our county jails, in our university and children's hospital settings, in our community hospitals. We could turn uncompensated care into covered care to help stabilize the delivery system. I mentioned the county jails, municipal governments, and the estimate that we have is that the expansion could be a billion new dollars in expenditures on the health care side. And remember the blue map? It's not going to be mostly in central Arkansas. It's going to be mostly in rural Arkansas where our health care system is most fragile and most burdened by uncompensated care. So this is the budget. Shortfall, I'll just, uh, this is uh, on the Medicaid website. It's probably too small to see. The, the dark blue here is state general revenue. The lighter color blue is the trust fund expenditures. The gray bar here are the total of uh, federal expenditures. I want to draw your attention. See this little place right here? This is when the stimulus funding was taking a load off of us. And this is when we've been expending our trust funds down to supposedly going to be zero in June in June, and the red difference is what we don't now have covered on the proposed budget going forward. So this is a big 
issue that our General Assembly is going to have to struggle with, that their executive branch is going to deal with, that we're going to be looking at the end of December's financial projections, because if the economy comes back faster than projected, then we have more general revenue that we could put forth. It's also a big issue of why we're pushing so hard on the payment improvement initiative, the faster we can turn that battleship so that it's not consuming as much fuel, the more we'll have fuel in the gas tank to go forward and farther. These are Dr. Allison's projections he put in front of the uh, legislative committee last month. Uh, there will be, because of the mandate, some new folks come onto Medicaid that we are not now providing. So there is an expenditure, and what he did is he split it up into the first full year of the 100% funding, and then he said the first full year when we owe 10% of the federal match. So two different columns here. New Medicaid expenditures will have new people come on that will grow. We will save in the Medicaid program, not paying for things that we pay now, like pregnancy that I mentioned just a moment ago, $60 million a year, and that will continue. There'll be some additional state revenue. We can't spend a billion dollars and not generate some taxes off of that. And we have the ability to reduce support for programs that are paid for with 100% general revenue, uncompensated uh, care, for example, in our uh, community mental health centers and others that get no Medicaid match whatsoever. So in his estimates, and he is a health economist, which is one of the better recruits that we've had to the state, you know, conservatively, he believes that the expansion on Medicaid helps solve some, not all, of the deficits on our Medicaid program that, whoops, in the early years, it could be as much as $90 million a year in savings. And in the out years, again, when we start having to pay 10%, that it is really a pretty small amount, $4 million on what by 2021 is projected to be a seven or $8 billion a year program. That's a pretty small delta that could be made up over time. So these are the difficult issues that I think we have before us. There are two big questions before the legislature from the healthcare perspective. One is, do we run the health insurance exchange? The Affordable Care Act is clear. If states choose not to, the federal government will. And the second is, based upon the Supreme Court decision, are we going to allow our Medicaid program to expand its coverage, to take advantage of the 100% federal funding in the up years, and to basically close the gap in coverage that we have between a very restrictive Medicaid program now and private insurance coverage in the future. This is not easy. Uh, it is incredibly complex. There are a number of moving parts. What I'm very pleased to report and to share with you is we've got good dialogue and good discussion going on in a relatively nonpartisan way. There are states that are not having any conversation right now because they cannot get past the R&D difference to even sit down at the table and start to discuss where they want to go and what they want to do. Arkansas has always pulled together and helped make the right thing happen for our citizens. And I think this is going to be a very difficult and, and I think intentionally deliberate debate. Uh, but going forward, I'm confident that with the opportunity, uh, and with the challenges on the table uh, that will make the best things happen and we'll try to avoid the risks that the Affordable Care Act uh, uh, presents to us. And I'm hopeful that a year from now uh, we can come back as we launch uh, whatever if, uh, is going to happen in January of 2014 and give a report to you on what went as we expected and what did not go as we expected. So let me with that close and I'll be glad to take questions and anything goes. Thank you. Good job, Greg. All right, questions, and please wait till the microphone gets to you on the back row, Bob. Hi, my name is Leslie Watterson. Um, I have a lot of friends that are in nursing school or medical school right now, and I'm kind of curious to if you could expand a little bit more on the um, comprehensive healthcare healthcare package. Um, some of the concerns that my friends are talking about, they're saying, well, whose responsibility is it if the patient doesn't improve? Is it you know, is it patient non? non-compliance or is it um, someone within the medical field's fault or is it malpractice or you know bad diagnosis or that sort of thing so I was just hoping you could expand on that and talk about it a, sure. little more, a bit more. So a, a couple of questions inside of that one if I can. One is kind of for for the team-based care with responsibility with a quarterback being assigned what if the patient doesn't want to play the game uh, essentially. Uh, you know, I think we have the patient with all the skin in the game right now. It's their health outcome that is the real issue. Uh, and as we have talked to providers across the state, just to use an example, for congestive heart failure, for 
somebody over 65 that's hospitalized for congestive heart failure and they get discharged, one in four get readmitted within 30 days. One in four, 25%. And it's about a $20,000 pop when that happens. Here's the compliance. We may have a few patients that are non-compliant, but I'd rather back up and say, are we really doing the best job on patient education, on home follow-on care, on using technology to give the patient a scale that they step on once a day and a nurse is back at the hospital checking on? We have hospitals in this state, White County Medical Center, who's got a home monitoring prob uh, program that uses electronic scales to monitor discharges to see are you gaining weight again and is your heart failure getting worse to intervene before the patient comes back in. Now there's no question if that patient's sitting at home salting things up that they're going to be gaining weight and we got plenty of those patients. But I think there's a whole education and engagement part that the financing system has never paid our clinicians to invest the needed time to have full engagement with our patients. Let's get full engagement with our patients first, and then our payers, Medicaid, Blue Cross, and, and we hope Medicare, uh, actually are discussing what do we do with those non-compliant patients that with full engagement on the provider side, we still as a team, payer and provider, are failing to get the outcomes that we want. Yes, right here, question right here. Dr. Thompson, John Riggins. Uh, Arkansas was the last state in the nation to have a trauma system. And, um, Sorry, since, to have a what? Um, to, uh, a trauma system. A trauma system, yes. And since we uh, instituted the trauma system, we're seeing some tremendous results in uh, reduced mortality, et cetera. But as we save people's lives, you know, now we have the, the issue of rehabilitation. What do we do? How do we uh, help people with traumatic brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, traumatic amputations? What do you see is the future of rehabilitative services uh, within uh, Medicaid expansion? Sure. So important kind of success story that I want to claim because many of y'all helped us get there. Our trauma system, if you're on a wreck in rural Arkansas, three years ago it took us eight hours to know where you were going to end up. Today it's less than 10 minutes. Doesn't mean you're there in 10 minutes, but we at least know where we're trying to get you. Uh, so, but you're right, that leads to more survival and therefore more need for follow-on rehabilitative and, and, and support services. This is where the Affordable Care Act, I think, on the one hand helps and on the other hand will cause a little bit of a challenge. On, on the helping side, it now requires every insurance plan to include rehabilitative services. The insurance department is going through the definition process of what services those are and at what level of support that would be. But historically, the insurance industry has been able to exclude certain services, frequently rehabilitative services, also frequently preventive care services, and some others. The Essential Health Benefits Plan will require private insurance to cover rehabilitative services. The Secretary of Health and Human Services put out a letter of direction to the Medicaid directors that essentially parallels what she'd already done for the private insurance, saying you must have this minimum benefit package and it will include rehabilitative services. We were at the insurance department yesterday helping to try to make the services line up on both sides so that the private sector and the public sector are offering the same, if not the same, similar service support uh, because uh, the citizens need it. But both on the Medicaid and the private in insurance side, the essential health benefits will be required to cover rehabilitative services. On the downside, when you cover something more, it's going to cost more. So, okay, so one of the issues is finding the balance of what is meaningful coverage that we can afford, recognizing that we're still an impoverished state. So I think that's one of the challenges that the Affordable Care Act offers, uh, particularly on the uh, private insurance side. Got a question right here. Wait, wait for the microphone. It's coming at you from behind. Thank you. Uh, my name is Matthew Glass, and I'm just curious to know what's your take on implementing copays is one of the ideas that's been tossed around by some of our politicians and I say that from the standpoint of I have a child who's currently enrolled in our TEFRA program which you know is based my premium is based on my income my child's insurance premium is about three times what my brother put, pays for his healthy son he went to the doctor 43 times last year how can you how can someone not as fortunate as I pay a copay 43 times. Sure. So, so let me, uh, TEFRA is one of those patchworks that we use Medicaid for, for families that have a, a severely ill child. And the higher you are on the income, the 
higher your copayment is. Question is uh, discussed in the Medicaid uh, dialogue among our General Assembly members and others are the use of copayments. I want to deal with this in, in two or three ways. I, I think one is a false sense that fraud and abuse is rampant in our Medicaid program and that copayments would somehow reduce that. I don't doubt that we have some fraud and abuse and we need to actively search that out and eliminate it in a targeted drone-like strike. Uh, but to do it, you know, to carpet bomb the whole system to try to get those specific issues is, is kind of the, the wrong thing to do. The second is, you know, the federal government has always uh, been fairly restrictive on applying co-payments to lower income individuals. We do have some co-payments on the Our Kids B, the higher income kids. We do have some co-payments on the TEFRA program at the higher income uh, eligibility levels. Co-payments we know from studies do a few things. If you put a co-payment on a preventive service, people aren't going to get it. I mean, we've done a randomized control trial, the RAND health insurance experiment that said if you put a co-payment on a preventive service, you reduce utilization significantly. And the last thing we want to do with a relatively unhealthy population is make them use preventive care less. So we don't want to put broad co-payments on. We also know that when we put co-payments on people that cannot pay, it's essentially a cost shift to the provider. Okay, we're telling the provider, well, your bill's $100, but there's a $10 co-payment. Well, if the patient can't pay the $10, then the provider's only getting paid $90 on a $100 bill. So we've got to be careful on the provider side that we're not essentially doing a cost transfer to providers. I will say, however, that we do need to think about how we align the patient's incentives to use the health care system in the right way. Right now we have too many people using the emergency room as their primary care source. We have too many people that are saying, let me go when it is convenient, not participate in the system as it's designed. Now on the flip side, we've got access issues. Providers only having clinic visits Monday through Friday from 8 to 5. We've got to have our providers have a Saturday morning clinic for the mom who's working all during the week. Straight point in, in contingent. There are several proposals to increase consumer accountability, if you will, for using the system in the right way. I think we need to look at each and every one very critically to make sure that, number one, it does no harm, and number two, that we're likely to get the intended outcome that we want. Inside of that, we ought to look at it. Outside of that, then somebody's using it, in my, from my perspective, for a goal other than the intended health outcome that we're trying to get to. Thanks, Dr. Thompson. Sure. Um, I have a question about the 42 million um, expanded coverage cost mm -hmm. estimate in Dr. Allison's presentation right. for fiscal year 2015. You've mentioned that one of the ways that the state might save money um, if we expanded Medicaid access was to increase the match from 70% to you know 100 or 90% on that areas like prenatal care of expanded right. expanded Medicaid coverage the state's currently covering. Um, is that is the bulk of that 42 million then children that are currently eligible for our kids, but their parents are low income and not availing themselves of it? Can you I sure. guess, speak specifically to I guess unpack that number and then maybe sure. more generally about the so-called woodwork effect? Sure, and, and, and let me just back up so that we keep the lingo on the table. There is, across all the Medicaid programs, any time you expand coverage, uh, there is, uh, in the experience, what's called a woodwork effect. People who were previously eligible but not enrolled in the Medicaid program. And so when we expand coverage, it generates an interest in getting coverage, and so people come onto the program that they were eligible before but never participated and enrolled. The Affordable Care Act requires the state to continue the current Medicaid program as is. So we have to keep pregnancy coverage, we have to keep the disabled coverage, we have to keep the TEFRA program, we have to keep the other programs for kids that we have going. When this rolls out and we have the insurance department or the federal government, whoever's running the insurance exchange, offering coverage, and we have the Medicaid program offering coverage, we will have, and I think Andy's estimates, these are, these are rounded off, there are about 20,000 people, some kids, some adults, that are eligible that will come onto the program, and because of the federal rules, we will have to keep paying our 30%, which is where the 42 million comes from. Now, what I'm going to say, I hope, doesn't get back to Washington, but this is the reality that every state's doing. For pregnancy coverage, just go with me there, we cover 
over 50 percent of the pregnancies in the state. We pay 30 percent right now of state revenue. Feds match that 70 percent. When we expand a full benefit package, we talked a while ago about the essential health benefit package being a full package inclusive of pregnancy, and the federal government's paying 100 percent of the full package inclusive of pregnancy, and somebody's on the full package inclusive of pregnancy who becomes pregnant, they're not going to leave the full package to come back over here and sign up for the pregnancy only package. And when they stay on the full package, they stay on 100 percent federal dollar so that over time fewer and fewer women are going to sign up for pregnancy only. Actually some of the women we cover now will be on private insurance. Those over 135 percent on the health insurance exchange will be covered on private health insurance. But fewer and fewer women are going to sign up. Pregnancy is the easiest because we cover the most pregnancy, we cover a majority of the pregnancies. Every other Medicaid program, TEFRA included, if you have a full benefit package on private insurance, you're going to be less likely to come over and sign up on the Medicaid program for the Medicaid TEFRA benefit. So that over time is how there is attrition and Medicaid savings. The woodwork effect up front is present and people that are currently eligible but not enrolled, we anticipate would sign up. Andy's estimates are really, I think, very conservative uh, in that I don't, let's just say they're very conservative. He has to defend them in front of the legislature and I don't, so he, he, he wants to make sure that they're very conservative. Yes, we got a question right over here if you'll wait for the mic. Already complicated is the reimbursement and billing system for health care. Um, once this is enacted uh, and the state makes a decision, is that set? Will institutions be able to then follow that? Or will this be constantly changed in Congress and we're all <laughs> at the mercy of that? Well, I'm afraid we're all at the mercy of Congress and that we're not going to have anything to, to necessarily uh, uh, be able to count on there except for our congressional delegation and their leadership. So I think that's an important component. You know, our billing system for our Medicaid program in this state, Ray Hanley's in the back somewhere I saw, is actually one of the uh, uh, premier billing systems in the nation in part because of necessity. Uh, Ray put in with other support a long time ago an electronic billing system where our Medicaid providers frequently get paid within three or four days of their claim on the service as opposed to commercial providers which frequently can take months to get paid. So we've got a pretty good reputation for our billing mechanism. If the question is coverage, would Congress change the, the deal on the coverage? Uh, I think that is importantly why Governor Beebe extracted, or oh, that extracted may be the wrong word, secured a letter from the secretary saying that, uh, saying that the state could opt out at any point in time, if the, the burden became too great, if the state finances were not present in the future to pay our 10 percent share, if we were facing some of the, the uh, serious issues on the budget that, that, you know, I think we have serious issues, I think we have some solutions that we're pursuing, but if we didn't have other solutions, the state could opt out of this program in the future if, if Congress changed or the Secretary changed uh, the dynamics of the program so it was less advantageous to the state. I've got a question right here. Dr. Thompson, if we do not expand Medicaid and someone who's above 135 percent that gets coverage through the tax credits, but then they lose their job, what's going to happen to them when they fall below 135 percent? So this is, this, is, this is one of the most upside down things that we could do. If we, whoops, if we expand the private insurance exchange. People that are making more will get insurance, but if we don't expand Medicaid coverage, people, many of whom are working and making less, will not. The insurance exchange tax credits only extend down to 100 percent of the federal poverty level. So somebody can get help to buy insurance down to 100 percent. The assumption when Congress wrote the law is that the law would force everybody to expand up to 135 percent so there wasn't any issue. The Supreme Court threw us a curveball and actually depending on state decision we could end up, I call it upside down, where the poorest of our citizens are getting less support than more affluent citizens. 
And that to me seems like something that's upside down. And we can't really ethically allow that to happen. Now politically we've got to find a path through the snares and, and issues to get there, but it does not make any sense for our governmental system to fund upside down and differentially to support higher income individuals to get insurance than lower income individuals to get insurance. Anna, we've got a question right there. Here, Bob's got the mic. Thanks, Bob. Uh, thanks for being here today. I'm Anna Strong with the um, Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families. And, um, you know, we, we are very strong supporters of the Medicaid expansion and extending coverage to a lot of our Kansans. But I, I want to talk about the families that don't fit in a pretty box. Families who may have different types of coverage, families who may not have maybe a single parent family or may have parents in different states. Can you talk a little bit about what Arkansas is doing to, to help those families, help ease the process for those families as they try to find coverage for all the different members of their family? You know, Anna, it's a great question. And, and I think there are two places that, that we've really got to pay close attention to. One is that there will be families that come into the Medicaid program and that because they are successful, increase their income and have to move into the private sector insurance exchange and there will be families that unfortunately lose their job and fall down so the interface between the Medicaid program and the private insurance exchange is a critically important one now that's for a family that's a nuclear family and move in together we have other families split families as you mentioned families with parents in other states you know and we're going to have to essentially try to maximize the benefit to those families both public and private, and minimize the inefficiencies based upon largely federal rules and regs that tell us how we can operate our, pro our program. Uh, that is in part why I think there is an advantage, and right now the state is pursuing this federal-state partnership on the exchange where we get to manage the, when an Arkansan picks up the phone and calls the insurance exchange because it's not working, that family is going to be much more better served by an Arkansan answering the phone than somebody else. That's a separate issue, but I mean, we've got a federal exchange, we have a state exchange, we're pursuing a partnership right now, but I think you're identifying an issue that is, is going to be critically important and that we don't have fully worked out. I thought you were going to identify another issue that I want to raise, uh, which is we have families that are not documented for which the Affordable Care Act offers no support for whatsoever. So this does not solve health care issues or ameliorate the need for a safety net for those individuals that are undocumented and in our communities uh, uh, today. Final question, Joe, let me ask you this. How do you feel, uh, and obviously I have a few comments on this, how do you feel about this proposal or speculation about drug testing to, uh, for Medicaid expansion recipients? I thought you didn't get to ask a question. <laughs> I told you I was going to surprise you. You know, again, as a, as a faculty member and clinician, I am subject to drug testing. Uh, there is a reason for that, to make sure that I'm not inappropriately using the authority that the medical board has vested in me, either by prescribing inappropriately or abusing myself uh, of something that I have access to. Uh, I think we need, as I mentioned on the earlier comment, we need to think through what the issue on drug testing is. If the issue on drug testing is to identify someone with a problem, get them into care and get them treatment so that they no longer have an issue, then I think that's something that is a potential benefit. If the issue is to be punitive and to say because you have a problem, you therefore do not get a benefit, that to me seems to be short-sighted. Uh, so I, I say that, I mean, obviously I don't get to vote, but that's my advice, should anybody be interested in it at this point in time, of a path that might get us to something that makes sense. Ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, give a round of applause to Sergeant General Joe Thompson.